In the first two videos we started discussing this idea that principal components is related to finding the direction in which we maximize information, we maximize variability. And in the second video we discussed this idea that some rotation of the, the axis are going to give us one direction of maximum variability followed by different directions of less variability. And this was related to trying to find some projection of the data in which the covariance matrix was diagonal. So let's see action. And in this video, you're going to learn a couple of things. So the first thing is how to interpret eigenvalues. And we're going to talk about the script plot. Basically, in the example that I used in the previous video, we only have two bars. One was height 9 and the other bar was height 1. And the relationship between them would be something like 90% and 10%. Okay? The other thing that we are going to learn is to analyze the contribution to each PC coming from each variable. And we're going to use the correlation cycle in which we have the two dimensions, typically the first two dimensions, which are the most important ones. And the variables are going to be represented by arrows. Another way of representing this is using the absolute value of the contribution. And again, we're going to have different criteria to, to realize which variables are more important. The other thing that we are going to learn is how to visualize observations projecting over the PCs. And this is the same that we did before. Uh, we are rotating the axis, and in this new axis, we're going to see all the information colored with different attributes. So we can have, let's say, multidimensional information in a 2D plot. But before we start, a piece of advice. So imagine that this is our data set. So we have the columns are variables and the rows are observations as usual. We're going to use typically one part of the table in, in order to perform the PCA analysis. And we're going to remove additional information for exploring additional possibilities. So we're going to leave some of the observations apart and we're going to call that auxiliary observations. We can use this in a couple of ways. One would be something like using cross-validation in the sense that we can repeat over and over again this experiment and changing the number of auxiliary observations. But sometimes we, only, we are doing this because we want to explore the effect of all the information just in a couple of variables. This is used in economics, for instance, in which sometimes you leave a country, let's say Spain, and you analyze different metrics for different countries, and then you try to look at, at how is Spain represented in this, in this map. We're going to leave apart also quantitative supplementary variables, and, and the idea is the following. Sometimes some variables do not fit very well with the other variables and we want to explore them separately and sometimes we just want to do some cross-validation so we want to remove some of the variables outside so we can repeat the analysis and see how robust the analysis is. And finally we're going to leave apart some qualitative variables and for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that PCA only works for quantitative variables but the other reason is that sometimes factors or qualitative variables or categorical variables the way you want to name it are interesting to explore different dimensions of the data. And don't forget our mantra, data should be standardized. Okay, there are tons of libraries for, for the job in R, as usual. So actually base R, so the one that you have without installing a library, has a couple of functions, prcomp and printcomp. Uh, they are basically work in the same fashion. But I'm going to use the, the library factomine R, which automatically gives you standardized information, but also give us a lot of information. So if you remember this diagram, this is the only function that is going to give us, uh, let's say, support for using supplementary, supplementary individual, supplementary quantitative variables, and supplementary categorical variables. The output is also interesting, and you can see essentially the scores and the loadings, which are the, the, the way that the variables has in, in the principal components and, and the coefficients that allow us to reconstruct each observation, each individual, using the principal components. Okay, let's go to the CIA and find some interesting data. And actually, they, they support this web page, which is called the World Factbook, which is really interesting to explore. So I have downloaded one data set, and let's explore that data set. Okay, remember that the idea is try to find what direction has the highest variance in the data, and try to see if the new covariance matrix, which is going to be multidimensional, has larger eigenvalues compared to the rest of them, so we can do this compression. Okay, so here you have the, the basic idea. So I'm using factomine R. This is the function PCA. And basically this parameter is, is the same as the default one, which means that before doing any analysis, the data is standardized. And forget about that for, for a while. So if you take a look at that, there is this, this variable inside this object, which is called A from eigenvalue. And here you can see different components. So the first principal component has an eigenvalue of 4.7 more or less and account for 27% of the variance. Compare this to the, this naive example in which this eigenvalue was 9 and the, the, the amount of variance was 90%. Okay? The second one has eigenvalue on 2.5 and between the two of them, they are already have 42% of the variance. So what can we do with this sort of matrix? Okay, there are two ways in which we can try to, 
to find the compression level or the cut the cutoff level. One idea is uh, remove all the dimensions whose eigenvalue is lower than one. So here you can see that up to component number six, the eigenvalue is larger than one, but this is 0.83. So this is one criterion. Why is that? Because the eigenvalue larger than one means that that principal component has more variance accounted than any of the original variables, uh, variables at the beginning. Okay, so this is one criterion. Meaning that this grouping, this com linear combination of, of variables is more meaningful than your original variables. Okay, another way to look at the data is take a look at this cumulative percentage. And sometimes you, you first fix the threshold. So you say, I want to cut off my data in 70% compression or 80% compression. And in that case, you look at what is the last eigenvalue in which you, let's say, overcome that threshold. In this case, both criteria are, arrive at the same level, which is six dimensions are going to provide us with a desired level of accuracy. A more visual way to take a look at eigenvalues is using this function, fvsa from Facto Extra. And here you can have the same information, so you can see that this is 27%, and now you can calculate, so you can count how many levels do you need in order to overcome the 70% threshold. And now the important part, so how can we understand these principal components? So typically we have this situation. This is, this is not general, but this is the kind of situation that you're going to find most of the time. So when there is a high positive correlation between all the variables, the first principal component has all its coordinates at, at the same sign, and can be interpreted as a weighted average of the variables. So this is called the size factor, meaning that all the information is already in the original variables, and here you're basically saying which variables are more important. And then the, the next principal components, despite the fact that they account for less variability, they are, can be interpreted as safe factors, meaning that some of the coefficients are positive, some of the coefficients are negative. So sometimes the second and third principal components are better if you want to discriminate between different variables or different individuals. What else can we extract from the analysis? The next thing that we can do is to plot a correlation cycle. So in that case, we're going to use this, this variable, which is called var. Var is not for variance, it's for variables. So remember, these are the columns of our data set. And we can plot the coordinates, which are the loadings. And by loading, I mean which is the proportion of each of the original variables into this, this, each principal component. Remember that these dimensions are principal components. So here you can say, for instance, that population has a small weight in the first dimension, so it doesn't account much for first dimension, but it's a strong in the third dimension. And for instance, infant mortality per thousand births is pretty strong in the first dimension, a pretty weak in the third dimension. So here you can have an idea of what's the contribution of each variable to each component. Okay, visually you can you can have the same information. So again, take a look at this graph. The, the horizontal axis is the first dimension, the first principal component, and the vertical axis is the, the second principal component. Here you can see that mortality per thousand births is negatively correlated with the second dimension. Remember that this is a minus coefficient, and this is close to one. The closer to one, the closer to the cycle. And if you take a look at crops, for instance, crops is a strongly negatively correlated with the first dimension. So one thing that is important to remember is that these new dimensions, these principal components are arbitrary. So they have no dimensions. They are not meaningful in the real life. So the sign is arbitrary. So the, the fact that this is negative doesn't mean that this is bad or good. It's something related to the way in which have defined this rotation of the parameters. Okay, another way to look at the to look at this table is using these correlograms in which we have this very visual idea of what's the importance of each variable. So you can see that the larger the cycle, the most correlated, the bluish ones are positively correlated and the reddish ones are negatively correlated. So here you have a very good description of the importance of each variable into each dimension. Again, if you take a look at crops, you can see that crops has a large red cycle in the second dimension corresponding to this arrow pointing down and close to the cycle head there. So there are many ways to look at this idea of contributions. Another way that I want to show you, because it's very visual, is using this function, which plots the contribution of each variable to the to different principal components. So if you, you don't say anything, it assumes that it's the first axis, the first principal component, but you can change that. And I'm only taking the first top 10 variables. Okay, if you take a look at the data, you can see again, mortality per thousand births is the most relevant, and then this, you have this decreasing order. You have this red dust line, and the meaning of that is this is one divided by the number of variables, meaning that if everything is completely random, if all the variables contribute the same to, to the first principal component, you would expect that all the bars have the same height. 
Everything that is well above this line means that this is a very relevant variable in terms of that dimension, and everything that is well below that bar, that line means that this is not relevant. Okay, in this case, you can see again that these are the five, the five most important variables. Again, this is not accounted for the sign, so if you combine information of the correlations with information of this contribution diagram, you can see that mortality per thousand births and birth rate are negatively correlated with the first dimension. So here comes the magic of PCA. So now you can have a good grasp of the meaning of the first dimension. So you can imagine that countries with a lot of phones per, per thousand people, with a large GDP per capita and with higher rates of literacy are going to be industrialized countries. And countries with, let's say, high mortality per thousand births and high birth rate are going to be developing countries. And the second idea is that this is a shape factor because not all the coefficients have the same sign. So you can see red spots and blue spots. And that means that this, this first dimension is going to be really good discriminating countries. Okay, let's take a look at the second dimension. Again, we have this reference line, which is one divided by the number of variables. And here you can see that only four are clear above that line. So the most relevant variables are other crops, arable, and net migration. Again, if you take a look at the signs in this column, you can see that other and let's say net migration are positively correlated and, and these two uh, crops and arable are negatively correlated. Again, uh, this could be interesting because sometimes net migration could be a sign of an uh, industrialized country, but, but that's not for sure. So this is going to provide some flavor to the first description of the data that we did with the first dimension. Okay, we've talked a lot about variables. So let's talk about rows in the data set. Let's talk about observations or individuals. In this case, we have this representation. This is a rotation in the new uh, in the variables, in the new principal components, and then a projection into just two dimensions. So this is kind of compressing all the information from higher dimensions. So you can see that you have this banana shape distribution of points. Sometimes it's hard to see. And if, you, if the data set is not that large, you can use this parameter repel equals true. That is going to repel the labels from the points. So you have something more like that. And again, this is a good representation of what's the role of each observation into this diagram. Of course, it's hard to see anything. So let's take a look at the outliers. So this point is Micronesia. Okay, I, I can understand why it's an outlier because probably it's a, a very small country. This point here is Liberia, and, and then you can have a good idea. Remember that the first principal component, so being in this part, means being correlated with large GDP, and this means being negatively correlated with, or positively correlated with you know, high mortality and so on and so forth. So Spain is more or less like there. Sometimes this is kind of unclear, and, and sometimes you need more information like, I don't know, categorical variables in order to, to extract additional information from this diagram. Again, there is another way to represent both information at the same time, and it's called the biplot, but I don't recommend it much because sometimes it's too much information in, in just one diagram. So the idea is that you can plot, this, you have the scores, but also have the directions. And, and okay, if, if instead of numbers you have labels, maybe you can extract some information, but sometimes this is kind of messy. And if you have some categorical variables there, like for instance the region, then this, this sort of graph can become more interesting. So this is again the score plot, and I'm using different colors for different regions. And again, if you try to localize some of them, let's say Western Europe, this is clearly located in the first dimension. Remember that first dimension was related to countries with large GDP, large number of phones, and so on and so forth. And for instance, there you, you can have Sub-Saharan Africa, and again, this is strongly correlated with low of those variables, but also highly correlated with high mortality, high birth rate. What about the second dimension? Second dimension was related to rural areas. And you can see that some, some of these countries have a strong correlation there, but negative correlation there. So that means that splitting the world in between Western Europe and the rest of the world is not a very good idea because you're losing a lot of information. But again, you can see that this two-dimensional representation is much richer than, than the original data set. And of course, this is an invitation for clustering. So here you can see using empirical density, remember that this is not exactly GMM, but you can see that you can cluster, let's say, Sub-Saharia and the rest of the world, and there is some overlapping. So even if you're comparing just one part of the world, it's not easy to, to extract that information. But again, this is an invitation to explore the data from different angles.